Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session, Supporting the Journey, Adapting Library Services to Support the Entire Process of OER Implementation. Before the session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment to all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting the differences in opinions and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. The presenters can now begin the session and I'll put the full code of conduct and reporting form in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're so happy to see you. And thank you also for those of you who have participated in the poll that we had attached to this session. We just wanted to get a quick idea of who our audience was. Um, right now we're a little heavy on librarians with about 19 showing, about six teaching faculty, a couple of instructional designers, and at least two of you have claimed that we missed your category completely. So if you'd like to jot that in the chat as to how you categorize yourself, we're happy to address that. Um, also, this um, presentation is a little bit flexible in that we really want to make sure you walk away with something that is useful to you. So if there's something you are hoping to get out of this session that drew you to this, you also can feel free to place that into the chat. And we are try our best to make sure that we do address that. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. I'm gonna do a quick introduction for us. I am Nikki cannon Rich. I'm one of the research services librarians at Georgia Southern University. I'm also the liaison to the College of Science and Mathematics and the OER librarian. Um, I will be speaking today for our colleague, Debbie Walker, who is our current director of our um, Center for Teaching and Excellence, as she had a last minute obligation that took her away from this presentation. And I'll let Jeffrey and Beulah introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Mortimer. I'm the Discovery Services Librarian at Georgia Southern. Um, I'm a colleague of Nikki's in the Henderson Library at Georgia Southern. And uh, um, I've helped uh, Nikki and a number of faculty out with a number of OER projects over time, and we'll be speaking to that some today. Hello, everyone. I'm Dula Narendra Prabhu. I'm a lecturer in the chemistry department and chemistry and biochemistry department at Georgia Southern University. I also coordinate a comprehensive general chemistry course for engineering majors. Okay, so here's a little bit of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about our own OER journey here at Georgia Southern the role that we've seen with our Center for Teaching Excellence in our OER team, um, the implementation of one particular OER, not all of them obviously, and then we especially want to focus on that faculty perspective from Beulah. Um, a little bit about terminology that we may be throwing out of there that you might not be familiar with. When we talk about ALG, we are talking about Affordable Learning Georgia, which is a USG initiative that's aimed at simply providing funding for faculty to develop OER for their courses. CTE, of course, is our Center for Teaching and Learning, and that center provides and supports teaching and learning through face-to-face -face, online or blended workshops for our faculty. Um, FLC is a faculty learning community, which many of you have heard talked about in other sessions, probably do them at your own campus as well. It's a specifically designed group of faculty members engaged in a collaboration to learn about specific evidence-based evidence teaching criteria. Um, we'll be talking about LibGuides, which is simply a content management and information sharing system that was designed specifically for libraries. You may call them library guides or research guides at your institution. 
And we'll have a brief mention, of course, of UDL, the Universal Design for Learning. I will say that any of these that had a line on them are linked out so that you can see additional information on those resources. And that LibGuide one does link out to our OER library guide at Georgia Southern. So our journey began in earnest, I would say, in 2017, though ALG had been running since about 2013 in the University System of Georgia. Now, we did have some faculty at Georgia Southern who had participated in ALG and received some of those grants, but they had basically done so um, solo without a whole lot of help from anyone. So in 2017, when I came on board, I knew that ALG had library champions from a previous institution I was at. I asked who our library champion was, and the current dean at the moment said, it's you if you want it. And I said, yes, please, I want it. So I began in 2017 and almost immediately began partnering with Debbie Walker from CTE. And she actually approached me first. She had heard of OER through another initiative meeting that she had attended through the University System of Georgia. And she was very interested in learning more. So we basically began offering the one shop workshops through our Center for Teaching and Excellence. They already had a strong program of workshops for faculty, so faculty were accustomed to that level of professional development. Um, our CTE also does a badging program through the workshop, so faculty can obtain digital badges um, in different aspects of teaching and professional development. And so OER was added to that for innovative teaching methods. So they were able to count these toward their badging. And then in 2018, we decided to offer a six week faculty learning community to go a little bit deeper into this. We had eight faculty who started, six actually finished. And you can see our advertisement on this slide for the FLC. Our goal in this was to encourage those participants to apply for one of the ALG textbook transformation grants. And we had two groups who did complete that and submit ALG grants. Okay, so why did we decide to do an FLC? Well, if you um, happen to go to a previous session, fill in the OER gap, connections and collaborations, you may remember that they mentioned they were seeing a lot of repeat faculty at their one shop workshops. And we saw the same thing. We saw the same faculty coming over and over again to these workshops on the basics of OER. What is OER? Why should you care about OER? Um, to the point where I would look out and see somebody and say, oh my goodness, Dr. So-and-so, at this point, you could teach this with me. I'm not covering anything new. I love to see you here, but why? Um, they just couldn't seem to get beyond those definitions and really jump in. So we wanted to offer this FLC to kind of force them to do that so that we could talk about the definitions, but then through our curriculum, we could actually force them to do some hands-on and start applying some of those definitions so that hopefully they would start to make sense and they could see how this could actually be incorporated into their classrooms. We did ask them to come with at least one class in mind that they felt they might want to use OER to either supplement or completely replace course materials. And of course, our hope was to also provide some guidance and options for what materials were already out there that might help them with this and fit the bill. It should be noted that ALG also supports using library resources to bring down the cost of those course materials for students, even though they are not completely OER. Next slide. Okay. So our role for Debbie and CTE in this, um, Debbie will tell you repeatedly that when she does observations for many faculty, one of the things she sees over and over again are some of our faculty, not all of them, but some of them who are using the proprietary materials, honestly haven't taken a whole lot of time to familiarize themselves with the actual materials they are using. And so there are some problems sometimes with what they're teaching doesn't necessarily align with the materials they are using. 
different terminology may pop up in the PowerPoint slides or in the text or on the exams. Sometimes things are in the test bank that they did not necessarily cover within the course of their lectures and things of that nature. And there are some times when faculty aren't even completely aware of this misalignment. So she spends a great deal of her time correcting that and helping them navigate through that. And so she wanted to make sure that from the beginning with faculty developing any OER, that she could help them develop strong learning objectives that went with their course and develop the appropriate assessment and make sure everything aligned so that the course was overall stronger than maybe it had been prior, or at least as strong if it was a really awesome course to begin with. So once our faculty completed this FLC, in some ways we might have thought, well, our work is done. We got them hooked on OER, and now they have this ALG grant, and they have some funding to do it, and they're going to create something awesome, and it's going to be great. And we realized that the work had really just started at that point. Um, the particular chemistry group we're highlighting today that Beulah was a part of, was a chemistry faculty that was creating an OER for a specialty chemistry course. And she'll tell you a little bit more about that. And they were also seeking a platform for delivery. Like how can we present this to our students so that it's dynamic? It can include some video because we think that would help them a lot. We wanna add some infographics. We wanna add some of our own problem sets and question sets and all of these things that will help our students be more engaged with this material. And all of this needed to be easily accessible. It needed to go along with our learning management system, and it needed to be something they could easily update, manipulate, and change because they knew that they would not necessarily always be the faculty who would be teaching this particular course. And as a huge SpringShare guru, I'm not going to lie, I was like, I think a LibGuide can handle this. I really think we could just put all this in a LibGuide and it would be perfection. And so Jeffrey's now going to take over and tell you the amount of chaos I caused in his life with that attitude. Thank you. So, yeah, um, as Nikki has described, um, you know, uh, throughout the course of the FLC, um, you know, Nikki and Debbie were able to work with um, the faculty to really develop, a, you know, an understanding of OER and how to develop it and um, um, how to align it well with um, the course curriculum. Um, but all the time hanging over um, this process is uh, hosting. How are you going to host this material and make it available and accessible um, to students? And, uh, uh, you know, tr traditionally, you know, a lot of uh, 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 programs have um, utilized uh, institutional repository platforms like Digital Commons um, to provide access to uh, um, uh, like discrete file types, PDFs, and other files. Um, but as Nikki has described, uh, this project with Beulah and her uh, colleagues really required that we provide a, a dynamic um, uh, platform, uh, something that would allow them to embed and make use of a lot of um, mathematical equations. And those equations need to be accessible to students who have accessibility concerns, um, as well as they wanted to embed videos and other content. And in, in the course of the development of this project, they identified um, the OpenStax Chemistry second edition textbook as the sort of source text that they wanted to use for the project. And um, you know, as Nikki said, you know, she as this project was developing, she felt like we can we can make this work in Digital Commons, uh, excuse me, in, in LibGuides. Um, so she contacted me and um, we took a close look at the OpenStax content and uh, realized that at the time that we were developing this project, OpenStax allowed you to download the sort of backend XML files um, for the textbook. Um, so we were able to run some, uh, uh, some trials, uh, download that XML and see if we could adapt it to LibGuides and, and make it um, uh, look the way that um, and behave the way that the faculty would need for this project. Um, and we could. Uh, and so, you know, 
very early in the process, we, we recognized that LibGuides would be a good platform for this. And, and why? Why is it a good platform? Well, first of all, it's already paid for. Um, many libraries have had a long-standing relationship with SpringShare and have used um, LibGuides extensively to deliver library resources. We were just the same. There was no need to go out and look for a new platform um, to provide this OER. And there was no need for um, Bula and her colleagues to, to um, incur any additional cost um, looking for a, another platform to get this done. Um, another important aspect is that uh, it's a familiar platform, especially to librarians who have a lot of experience developing LibGuides and adapting content to that uh, uh, CMS context. Um, so we knew going into the project that we could appropriately support the faculty um, uh, using the, the, the platform for this purpose. Um, similarly, the platform is easy to teach. Um, faculty have a lot of experience using CMSs. At Georgia Southern, we have Desire to Learn as our learning management system. And so um, uh, making the shift from Desire to Learn to uh, LibGuides was relatively easy for our faculty. Um, and they caught on to that quick, quickly. Um, also very importantly, by adopting LibGuides, um, we were able to minimize our, our need to work with campus IT um, to develop the, uh, the, the, the OER. Um, and uh, our IT folks are great. Um, they do an incredible job for, for the university and, and for the teaching faculty. But anytime you can hold a project in-house um, where you can do the troubleshooting and problem solving on your own side, and don't need to burden IT um, with those tasks um, is a good idea. It's a, you know, it just really streamlines the troubleshooting process um, and the development process for that matter. And also LibGuides um, you know, is, was beneficial because it allowed us to achieve the look and feel that we wanted for the textbook. Of course, we were able to obtain XML files, source files from OpenStax to adapt. Um, and then we were able to apply our own style, our own look and feel to that content um, as we went along. So um, the uh, development project uh, or the development process for this project um, really came in three steps. Um, over the course of several months, um, some steps moved more quickly than others. Um, but because of the size and complexity of the project, we, we really needed um, a framework um, that would allow us to focus on updating content more so than uh, dealing with the platform and dealing with the process of getting the content on there. Again, LibGuides worked quite well um, for this because uh, we were able to grab those XML files from OpenStax, clean it up, remove um, custom IDs and classes and other extraneous HTML from those files and upload it relatively clean so that we could then adapt it um, uh, and the faculty could adapt it uh, to what they needed. And then we could apply that style. Um, so the three steps, again, we started out with um, a lot of proof of concept testing. Um, as I suggested earlier, and as you can see on this screen, the, the, the text uh, that, that Beulah and her colleagues wanted to develop included a lot of uh, mathematical equations. Um, that need to be expressed appropriately and accessible. Um, so the way we were able to do this is to link the MathJax JavaScript library um, into LibGuides, uh, which would then um, format um, MathML XML formatted um, uh, equations appropriately, as well as give folks a certain amount of right click um, uh, options um, to work with that, um, ex to work with those equations. Um, so we, we initially, over about a month, um, performed the uh, proof of concept testing. And then we brought in, um, a, a Buell and her colleagues really focused down on the specific content they wanted to bring in from the OpenStax textbook. And we spent a couple of weeks importing that, um, you know, cleaning up the XML, importing the content onto the pages we wanted, um, and getting a rough draft in place of the textbook. Um, 
that that part of the process really um, focused on me and Nikki, um, you know, doing the proof of concept and providing the the, um, the shell for the textbook, and then and then the faculty helped us out to get the content in. Step two was really the work of the faculty themselves to update and adapt the content um, of the data of the the textbook, as Nikki has described in Beulah. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail is um, that they were adapting this uh, chemistry second edition textbook for a particular uh, group of students. Um, and so there was a lot of um, updates that they wanted to, to um, make to the text to, to make it work well for their students. So for a couple of months, um, they really focused in on, on updating the content. And um, at this point in the game, we, we really emphasize, do not worry about look and feel. We'll deal with that later on in the process. Um, so uh, they were able to update and revise the content. And then we made it step three, clean up and launch. And it's at that point that um, uh, I was able to go in and really uh, fine tune, double check, troubleshoot the HTML, and then develop a style sheet that we were able to apply to the text to get the look and feel that we wanted. And I have to say, and this is a proviso, it's, it's something that's important to be mindful of anytime you're developing an OER project. But uh, this project really benefited greatly from our faculty being uh, HTML and MathML whizzes. They, they really uh, were very comfortable getting into um, the HTML and revising uh, equations in MathML um, on their own, and they were they were really great at identifying problems and letting us know about it, so we can go in and troubleshoot and fix things. And uh, for a, a project of this complexity, that was a real benefit to us. Um, it was definitely a, a feature of our collaboration between the library and CTE and the faculty that they were able to participate in that process. And so, you know, as as you develop any OER project, it's just important to keep in mind what is the skill set of the faculty who will be um, working on this content and participating in implementation. Um, so with that, I'll have, hand it over to Beulah to, to talk about um, her and her colleagues' experience with this project. Um, unless I see there have been some questions to come through the chat. Nikki, is there anything we need to address immediately? Or um... I have been answering them as we okay, go. Okay, great. great. So let me hand it over to Beulah to, to um, Carry this forward. Thanks, Nick and Jeffrey. Um, so yes, our journey as faculty also began at the OER workshop. That was my first OER workshop. And uh, it was nice to get together with faculty from the chemistry department who had similar interests and form a collaboration. So I think the workshop really helped to form collaboration. And another thing is through the workshop, we were exposed to uh, copyright and attribution uh, content. Uh, and all this tremendously helped us as we are um, curating content for the textbook, we were mindful of what images to choose. Can I use this image in this textbook or not? So it exposed us to all those attribution elements. Uh, and also, uh, previously, we were not really paying much attention to accessibility, and that's one thing uh, we were not particularly aware when we had this idea that we want to um, curate content and create this uh, chemistry textbook. So we learned a lot, great deal about accessibility as well. Um, so, um, yeah, and um, the collaboration with the library personnel was excellent. I, I think without them, you know, we would be uh, stuck and we would not know how to go about this. So we came to know that LibGuides is best for hosting our resources. So that was amazing. And the LibGuide uh, platform worked very, very well. The students right now who are using the textbook, uh, they just uh, they can just mark the LibGuides page, bookmark it, and they have easy access to all that material right now. Um, and when we were interacting with the platform, again, as Jeffrey said, uh, I had a little bit of knowledge about HTML, but most of this stuff uh, I learned as we went along. Um, Word has a way of converting 
an equation into math ml so i learned that so we would write equations in word and then change them to uh, math ml format and try to include it in the html so um, i want to talk about my class and uh, what motivated this project uh, so i teach chemistry for engineering majors and this is a class of 200 students and there is one more section like that um, so a lot of time we were previously using 120 dollar textbook uh, for that uh, can you go to the next slide jeffrey thank you yeah so we were using textbook that costed us 100, 120 dollars for the students but some um, in some semesters, when I gave a survey, the students were not really using the textbook. And it was a thick textbook, a lot of chapters, um, and it was written for a two uh, semester chemistry sequence. But the course I'm teaching is all of this material in one single semester. So the chapter ordering was not particularly favorable for these engineering majors. Uh, there is one more textbook which is written especially for engineering students, but, but again, we ran into this issue where students were not reading this big, huge textbooks, they were mostly referring to videos online and getting information from there. So, so what we came up with is how about to use the open stacks, which is already uh, written very well, very easy to read, and then format it so that you know it is useful to engineering majors it has examples that are relevant to engineering majors uh, and it also has embedded videos that students can go to and look at and learn information from as you know students are not always uh, judging the uh, youtube resources very well and they're not um, sometimes they don't know what the best video is because they're not aware of uh, some of the elements of cognitive learning that we as instructors may be aware of. So it was it was really to take the OpenStax chemistry textbook and reorder the chapters and club some chapters together, remove what is not relevant, what we are not teaching in the class, and make a resource that is focused to engineering majors. Um, also, uh, embed problem sets and um examples that are relevant to engineering majors so that was our goal um yeah um, and also we chose sapling for um giving homework sapling costs us only uh, cost the students only 42 dollars and there they have homework sets that align with the open stack so it was a really nice way to have a textbook which is based on open stacks and also the sapling learning homework which is also based on open stacks Thank you. So as you can see, we have embedded multimedia into the textbook. We have gleaned resources from YouTube, Khan Academy videos, and really excellent videos that I use in my online teaching. So I embedded all um, most of those into the textbook. And uh, this textbook is right now a very useful resource that we can link to in our online teaching. Uh, when this course is taught, taught online, students don't engage with the instructor anymore and they want to uh, um, interact um, easily with the textbook. So we can just link it up, link up the LibGuides resource in our folio platform in the online course. Uh, next slide, Jeffrey, please. So the main feature of our textbook is this end of the chapter problem set. Uh, each faculty have been creating problem sets and giving to the students but now we compiled them together. We also chose problems that have application and put them into the textbook. So now if any uh, new faculty comes to teach this course, they have all this at their disposal and they don't have to go from scratch. They don't have to judge the uh, students, uh, what students, what questions are relevant for our students. They don't have to go through all that hassle. All of this is readily available for them. Next slide, Jeffrey. So these are the student perspectives uh, in one semester when we ask them for the feedback. Uh, they do find this resource as a very useful resource. I had one student who read two pages of uh, feedback, uh, how much he liked the textbook and how much he was uh, using it. So, and again, I would say one thing, 
uh, not all students are motivated to read the textbook and use the textbook like they're supposed to. So it really depends on how the faculty uses this textbook and talks about it in the classroom. So what I have been doing is in my slides or in the online, um, when I teach this course online, I have been embedding links uh, in the course on the PowerPoints and uh, in the folio pages to these textbook pages. That's one way I get them to look up these textbooks. Um, another is if you're doing a flipped classroom, there are videos that are already there in this textbook and it facilitates a flipped classroom for our course very well because it's 200 students uh, and not always, you know, the traditional teaching works for all concepts. Sometimes we want to give the material ahead and we want to work on only problems during the class. And these uh, curated videos really help any new faculty jumping in to into this course to have access to those videos and start a flipped classroom for any topic. So students said the uh, end of the chapter textbook problems were really very helpful to them. And it was also good for note taking and reading ahead. And in the chats, I saw that uh, one of you asked if we embedded any assessments into this textbook. That's our next goal. I haven't really um, thought about, I mean, um, worked with this after we developed this COVID came, we didn't really uh, follow up later. So that's one of my goals to embed uh, self-assessments that students can also use on the textbook at a later stage. Yeah. So, yeah, if, uh, so that's our journey. And if you have any questions about from the faculty perspective, if you want to ask any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Um, now I'll head back to, I mean, I'll give it back to Nikki. Thank you, Beulah. So future plans. Um, and basically, how did we end up adapting our library services? Many of you may be in a situation where you're also the only OER librarian in the place. Um, don't be afraid to pull in your colleagues. Um, Jeffrey's become far more involved in OER than he ever thought he was going to be. And it's been a wonderful collaboration between tech services and this public services aspects that really strengthens what we can offer to faculty. As Beulah mentioned, um, this is in a lib guide. Y'all, Beulah's product has caught attention of a lot of my other faculty who are now going through the ALG textbook transformation grant process. We probably have at least four to five additional um, text materials that are going to be produced in LibGuides in various forms, maybe not in the same way that Beulah and her groups it's presented, but in other ways. So part of the library services has now become training some of these faculty, of course, in LibGuides how to create in them, how to design in them. Um, need to beef up my training on accessibility in LibGuides because um, I have some faculty groups who have kind of blown that out of the water once they realize some of the pretty and nifty things they can do in LibGuides. And so now we're gonna have to rein it back and be like, okay, y'all, accessibility, okay? But let's stick to some of the formats that will help some of our users. Um, still have a very strong, relationship with our CTE, going to try to strengthen that pedagogical approach a little bit through additional workshop training. And we're hoping to do a lot of this asynchronous, as many of you may have found once COVID hit, um, that extreme pivot and all of the catch up that has had to happen and the turmoil. We, as much as we'd love to offer another FLC, we're hearing repeatedly from our faculty that they just do much better if it's an asynchronous training that they can do at their own pace when they have time, rather than trying to commit to something that they have to attend on certain dates at certain times during the course of a semester. So we're trying to produce these in asynchronous format so that when some of our faculty receive some of these ALG grants, we can provide some additional training and help for them in areas that we see they're still struggling, um, using proprietary materials with the OER materials, because again, ALG absolutely supports the use of library materials. Um, I now um, include my colleagues in technical services on any of the articles, emails, and blogs that talk about making OER more discoverable and accessible through our own library catalog and broadening kind of our opening mission. So our library services 
it not only changes, I think, with your faculty as you help them through this, because again, once they find that OER, your job is just beginning, just beginning with them. But you also start to increase your library services to your own colleagues and bringing them on board and helping them understand what this is all about and the very, very strong role that libraries and librarians do play in making this a successful venture on your campus. And that is it for us at this moment. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. We realize we're one of the last sessions of this conference and we're happy to take any additional questions you may have. Thank you guys for that presentation. There are some questions coming in um, into the chat. So I'll let you guys address that one. Um, and I'll add one in the question and answer. So um, I'll, we do have plenty of time for questions left. I see that. Um, one of the questions is, uh, do you have a link to the LibGuide? And uh, actually, okay, Bula beat me. So it's in, it's in chat now. And the question that came through, the question and answer is, were students able to print out the XML file if they wanted a hard copy? Actually, that's, that's a very fair question. Um, uh, for, for those of us who have experience with LibGuides, we know that um, sometimes printing uh, LibGuides pages is not, uh, it's not always easy. They don't always come out very well formatted. And so uh, uh, right now we, we do not have um, XML files for the individual pages available. Um, but I think that's something we definitely should put on our list um, of, uh, to carry the project forward. So thanks for raising that question. It is something that, that you know, we should all have in mind for accessibility um, uh, and for extending the usability of the text um, by allowing people to download it. Yeah, as Beulah did mention, some of our next steps, um, once they had turned in the initial report for the ALG grant, were kind of halted when COVID hit um, and everything kind of turned the focus on just being as supportive as possible to all of our faculty as they made that incredible and extreme pivot to entirely um, online teaching. So another question that's come in from Pamela is that what other options besides OpenStax might work well for importing into LibGuides? Um, this is a really good question. And most of my other faculty who are deciding to use LibGuides are not using OpenStax. We have one group that's using a Merlot book that um, they're kind of bringing in portions of it, not the entire thing, as well as some material that they created themselves so obviously, if you create the material yourselves, it's very easy to put it in a LibGuide. Um, LibGuide supports websites. Um, LibGuide supports PDF content. They support images. They support infographs. It supports um, links to things. So as I said, um, ALG does support the use of library materials. And so we are also able in one course to link to some materials that are within our library. Now, those are not completely open as stated. And when a student or anyone basically who gets on that LibGuide and clicks on that link, they will be um, prompted to authenticate. So that particular material would not be available to somebody outside of Georgia Southern, but it is available to our students free of cost and so helps bring that cost down. And of course, they just mention on the um, library guide in the licensings that it's licensed under this CC unless otherwise noted. Um, and then we make that very clear which parts are not actually CC licensed. And we have a group right now who is doing their own videos 
through our CTE and light board that they will be bringing into a lip guide. And also they're taking um, some images or having students take images. It's an exercise science class. So they're, they're doing some images to do some functions and things that they're putting in there along with some text. So it will support a whole lot of um, formats. Am I missing anything, Jeffrey? Uh, no, that's that's right. Uh, you know, in terms of um, discrete file formats, of course, you can you can pretty much link to um, you know whatever you want, and and of course, you have a pretty flexible set of formats that are accepted uh, for document assets and libguides. Um, you know, also uh, as Nikki has has hinted out here, you know, when you're looking at content on another website, very often you can you can obtain the source files and then use uh, Dreamweaver or Notepad++ to, to clean that um, HTML up for your own use. Or you know, if, you're, if you're borrowing um, open access or OER content from another uh, producer, you can always reach out to them and say, you know, we wanna make use of your material. You've invited us to use our, your material. Can you provide us with your source files? Um, uh, of course, again, when we started this project, um, OpenStax just had a very easy way of, down, of downloading those source XML, pop, XML files. I don't know if they still do that. It's, um, I, I haven't looked in a while, um, but uh, it, it, it bears you know, you know, contacting them if we were to work on a new project, see if we could get that, um, uh, or you know, um, seek other, you know, other means of obtaining that, those, that source file. But you know, even those source files, even the XML we used from OpenStax had to be cleaned up. It, it had a number of um, features, um, specific, specifically style-related features that, uh, that needed to be um, removed for us to make the best use of the, the underlying HTML. So again, it helps to have a couple of tools on hand, and it helps to have some, some folks around who are comfortable doing that kind of work. Which is again, the collaboration between public services and technical services. Um, Jeffrey does this more or less every day in a lot of the stuff he does, whereas I do not. So my skill set is not quite as developed in his, is adapting to that. Also OpenStax, as y'all know, has gone. Nikki, I think we may have lost you. Yeah, we can take the next question, maybe Jeffrey, um, from Lisa Lewis. Um, she asked, is there a music ML similar to math ML for coding music symbols and notation? We may have lost Jeffrey as well. Yes, it looks like we've lost. Abula, you're the only presenter left. <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> only Jeffrey is the person who can answer yes, this. Coming back. We lost Welcome back, him. Nikki. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm, okay, I'm back. I apologize. Zoom dropped me. So. I just went to no man's land with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done with you all now. I'm back. I'm back. So I apologize if I missed anything. No problem. Jeffrey, there's a question uh, from Lisa. Is there music ML to embed music symbols similar to math ML? Can you mm -hmm. take that question, please? Uh, I, I can take it so far as to say I don't know. That's an excellent question. I, um, I've only worked with math ML as part of this project. So I really can't speak to other formats, but it's worth knowing there are a lot of XML formats out there um, to accommodate different, different kinds of notation and representation of, of um, formatted text. So um, uh, I have no doubt that there are resources out there for that purpose. Presumably, you know, there's an XML standard for expressing music. And then um, hopefully you would be able to find a JavaScript library that would allow you to, to represent that on the screen. Um, again, that's part of what's nice about LibGuides. You can, you can oh, looks like someone found something. So that's great. Ooh, 
look at that. That's pretty. I just want to mention one thing um, related to the question about is there a PDF that is downloadable or not. Right now, we don't have a PDF that is downloadable for this textbook. Um, but since we are working with OpenStax, um, the OpenStax content is linked in the homework. So if a student has any questions or if they want to download, they can always switch to the OpenStax textbook. Right now, that's how we have been maintaining the accessibility issue. But in the future, yes, we would also like students to print these pages and use them. Yeah. Yeah, we'll eventually catch up from the COVID slide, as I call it. Any other questions for our panelists? I'm not seeing any come in. Um, so I wanna again, thank all of you for your presentation. It was very um, interesting and informative and inspiring to go and try and do this, that type of activity on our campus. So um, we do appreciate the time and effort you put into this. And for the rest of you, thank you for attending. You are um, free to go and I'll have Laura or Stephanie stop the webinar. Thank you.